My father says dying in America is, is, is almost a punishment. The costs associated to it, right? The difficulties associated, it can be, unless you're prepared and you're ready. Um, if someone passes away at home, you should be ready for an autopsy. If you pass away at home, does anyone know who to call if you die at home? Who's the first person, what's the first call you make? 911. Yeah, most people don't know that. Uh, before anyone arrives at your house, the police will arrive at your house. Um, if the person has a medical condition, makes life a lot easier. The doctor is probably going to sign off on the certificate, the death certificate. But if not, then, then it could be a somewhat lengthier process. Um, having a good relation, if you're, if you're older, if you have a family member that's older, um, having a decent relationship with the physician, right? It's very, very important. Uh, no, not by law, but be, expect one. If that person doesn't have a medical condition, then they want to know how this person passed away. Right? If the person has a medical condition, you have a decent relationship with a doctor, doctor kind of already knows that, hey, this person's probably going to pass away soon. So they'll sign off. Have a good relationship with the physician because if you pass away on a Friday afternoon or a Friday evening or a Saturday morning, unless that physician signs off, uh, you can't bury your deceased. Right? Uh, alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, I'm honored to say that we live in a community where if someone even passed away on a Friday night, we can most probably get them buried by Saturday afternoon. Most Muslim communities in the United States cannot say that. If you pass away on a Friday or Saturday, you will most probably have to wait until Monday or even Tuesday to bury them, bury them because we don't have relationships with the local coroner's office, with the local county office, and so on and so forth. In the Bay Area, we have an imam from India uh, who has been doing this for so many years that if you ever tell him someone passes away on Friday and they go to the nearby masjid and they say, oh, we can't bury you until Monday, he says, who says you can't? Bring him to me. Bring me the paperwork. I'll take care of it. I'll make sure your janazah is on Saturday. And just, in fact, just recently, um, just recently, uh, uh, we had an individual who passed away late Friday night in the month of Ramadan. A, 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 a lady, a sister, uh, in her 40s, who died of cancer and leaves behind an 11-year-old child. Um, she passed away on Friday night. We had her janazah on Saturday. We went, the, the family went to one masjid, and that masjid told them and said, okay, we can get you your paperwork on Monday. And so they called me after taraweeh. I said, no, just call this person, this imam, and he will take care of it. They called the imam. Saturday morning, he was on top of things. Saturday after Salat al-Dhuhr, it was the Salat al-Janazah, and she was buried Saturday afternoon. And the reason I say this is because in our tradition, we are reminded by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that one should be buried as soon as possible. In fact, as I was preparing, I was going through some notes. Um, I went through an entire article where it's mentioned that were one to wait for the upcoming Fard prayer, for a larger congregation would be incorrect if the janazah could be done earlier than that. Right, so as soon as a person passes away, uh, one should endeavor to be buried as soon as possible. We believe you know, the ruh is somewhat semi-hanging, if, if we may call it that, um, and waiting for the, the alam al-barzakh to be buried, to, to meet the angels and so on and so forth. And so, uh, one should hasten in, in, the, in the janazah of an individual, in the burial of an individual. And one should make it very clear, as many people have to their family members, that when I pass away, don't wait for anyone. Don't wait for the oldest child. Don't wait for the child who lives in a different continent. Bury me. Because that's the right thing to do. Right? That's the right thing to do. I missed my mother's father's janazah, my nana's janazah, by 10 minutes. But he had made it very clear that as soon as I pass away, you bury me and you don't wait for a soul. To this day, my mother's been a little upset at her brothers. But that's okay. I've never held a grudge against anyone because understanding the truth, I know that that's what should have been done. I, I drove in and the people were just coming back from the graveyard. Right, so, it is what it is. Alhamdulillah. Um... Preparations. We're talking about preparations. Uh, make sure your kafan is ready. No one wants to talk about kafans. We have an extra pair of clothes or a suit lying around for a wedding or something that we may need to go to. Uh, but we don't have our kafan. Our kafan should be 
prepared for. Uh, as, an, as an elderly person once told me that I open the bag in which my kafan is in and I just look at it, that these are my clothes. I'm going to wear this for the longest time. Right? She says that I sometimes take them and bring them, put them in my hand and feel them and touch them. Right? Because that's what I'm going to wear. So make sure your kafan is ready. If it's not, the local masjid will take care of it for you. Where I come from in India, and some of you may understand this or have heard of this, where I come from in India, you only go for hajj once. Things have changed now, but where I come from, generally, you collected your money your entire life in your 50s, 60s, or 70s, you went for hajj. And one of the things that you took with you when you went for hajj was the white piece of cloth that was going to be your kafan. And you washed it in zamzam, and you brought it back with you. And some of you are smiling because you know what I'm talking about. Okay, it's a very common tradition in India where I come from. That's why if ever you've seen people drying these big white pieces of cloth outside the haram, uh, that's what it is. That's their kafan, right? And sometimes they take a very large piece of cloth so that it could be the kafan for multiple family members. Because that could be the only person in the family that's ever going for hajj. Right, so they wash it in. And there's no, there's no religious significance to this per se. There is a, there's a more traditional significance to this and they would wash it in zamzam and they would bring it back. And that would be something that they would treasure and they would keep very close to them. And if anyone in the family ever passed away, their kafan would be cut from that piece of cloth until it ran out. So make sure your kafan is ready. As I mentioned earlier, make sure there are clear-cut instructions for your family members as to what needs to be done, as to where you wish to be buried, as to how you wish to be buried, as to, you know, if you have any wishes, those, you know, they should be known. Um, you know, if you have children that you can trust, inshallah, that, that's, that's, a, that's very honorable for a parent, right? That if I, even if I haven't given instructions, I have children who know exactly what to do, that's very honorable. But otherwise, you know, making sure there's instructions. Uh, I like to remind people that make sure you leave aside some cash, uh, some money aside, um, because burying, uh, burials in the United States can be expensive. We need to, that's another, that's something we need to tackle. We need to figure out how we can bring down the costs of burials. If you happen to be in charge of a masjid in your community, uh, rather than, you know, making a basketball court or trying to figure out this new building that you want to build, uh, try to figure out a way where you can make burials cost effective in your communities. Uh, train someone, get someone licensed in your community to take care of, make them a funeral director, right? Buy buy a vehicle so that you can save on the costs. Transporting the body is very, I don't know, and I'm just speaking from my Californian experience, but transporting a body in California can cost anywhere between $1,500 and $2,000. Okay. Uh, buying a grave site, if you buy it at the local Muslim graveyard, it's about $1,500 and the opening and closing is about 1000 So it costs, it runs you about 2500 But if you go to any other graveyard, like for example, if you go to the one in Hayward, uh, the, 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 the cost of the grave site is $5,000 plus opening and closing costs you another 2000 If you go to uh, one of the graveyards that the Muslims in the Bay Area, or at least where I live, use is Los Gatos. And um, the burial site there alone is like $15,000. And I've tried to tell people, I've had cases where you have, and see, pe people really need to think of this spiritually. <sighs> I have had so, I tell you, I could sit here and tell you story after story after story, I would never teach you a thing. And Sidi Yahya would get very upset. Um, I've had a situation where, oh, Ya Allah, I, I had a family come to me and tell me that we're buying a gravesite in Los Gatos for $15,000 for our father because our mother is buried there. And I said, why don't you bury them in Livermore, which is a little ways away. It's a 45 minute drive away. I can get them buried for less than five grand. You take that 10,000 that you have, that you have, and send it to some impoverished country and build a masjid with the thawab going to your parents. I can find you places and towns and villages where I come from in India where you can build a masjid for $5,000. Give it as an endowment to 
to a college, to a masjid, to a university here in the Bay Area if you don't want to send money back home. And for, for as long as they, because you, and the justification was that when we go on Eid or whenever to make dua for them, we can make dua for both of them at the same time. I'm like, dude, I didn't say dude, but I said, you're going to make dua for them for how many years? You're already in your 50s. Okay, your children, no, 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 this is very, very real. This is very real. I'll tell you another story. And I cry and cringe to this day when I tell you these stories. You know, you will make dua for them for how many years? 50 years, your children will remember them for 50 years. Great grandkids for another 100 years. In 200 years, your parents are going to be forgotten by their own blood. By their own blood. But you make waqf of this $10,000 and people will, you will get that reward. They and you will get that reward until the end of time. Doesn't make sense to people. You know, people really need to think about these things. I had a situation once where a Muslim individual passed away. And the children, this is all in the Bay Area, um, passed away. Children chose to bury their father in a non-Muslim graveyard close to home. So you're being buried amongst non-Muslims. The biggest disadvantage, there's two great disadvantages of that. One, you're not facing the Qibla, which is a Sunnah. Two, two, there won't be frequent visits by Muslims to that graveyard. When we go to the graveyard, I've been taught, we've all been taught that you make dua for everyone that's buried there. And you, when you're buried in a, in a graveyard like this, you won't have daily visitors to the graveyard to make dua for these people, for your own father. But they said, we, live, we want to be close to our father. We want our father to be close, which is perfectly fine. That's your decision to make. But what's the disadvantage? I told that child and I said, listen, I'm going to be very generous. You may go to your father's grave every day for the next year, every other day for the next two years, every week for the next two years, every month for the next five years. Okay, I'm being very generous. You don't go that. But in 10 or 12 years, your visits are going to be maybe once or twice or three times a year. What happens after that? What happens if you move away? What happens if you leave? What happens when you pass away? What happens when your children and your grandchildren pass away? It's gonna be, not going to be anyone to make du'a for them. Whereas if they were buried in a graveyard, my own father traveled, my, one of my grandmothers, my great-grandmothers, she passed away of a disease in some town in India where they had a British hospital back in the day. Um, and... Um, my father always wanted to visit his grandmother's grave. So, and he didn't know where the grave was, but he just knew that she's buried in this town. And three or four years ago, he visited that town, went to the local masjid, found someone, told, asked them and said, I want a guide to take me to every Muslim graveyard in this town. And he stood by the gates of the, every graveyard, and he said, I think there was three of them. And he made dua for everyone, and he made dua for his grandmother. When he was done, he got on the next train and came back. Right. When my father comes to, my parents live in London. When my father comes to California, I know that I have to dedicate a day for him where I do nothing but take him to three or four graveyards. Because he has, he has friends that are buried there and he goes, this is my right upon them. And he goes, this is my haq. This is, I, if I don't do this, they will ask me on the day of judgment. And I can't bear that. I take him to the uh, uh, cemetery in Los Gatos. I take him to Hayward. I take him to Livermore. Then we travel to Lodi because Lodi has another Muslim graveyard. And I'm mentioning these names because some of you are from California and you know what I'm talking about. Right? So these are things we need to be conscious of and aware of. Ya Allah. Ya Allah. It's not easy to talk about death. Talk about it. Make it easy for your family. Think about it. Um, I'm going, my time is up, but... Um, I'm going to just go through this. Just bear with me. Um, and the, the Hanafi opinion is that it's makruh and dislike to purchase a gravesite before you die. Is there anything in the Shafi'i school? No? Yeah. The reason it's makruh is because you don't know where you're going to die. The reason it's makruh is because you don't know where you're going to die. But at the same time, um, if you live in the United States, you, you, you live in a certain community, there's a graveyard close by. The, the, the general uh, uh, contemporary opinion is that go ahead and purchase a gravesite. 
just so that cost is, you know, your children don't have to um, bear that cost. When you choose your grave site, think of the fact that you're going to be sleeping there for tens of maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of years. Ibrahim والسلام, has been in his grave for over 3,000 years. Like, that's your permanent home. Your permanent home are not these fancy zip codes that we live in. No, people, I know people like fancy zip codes. Better school districts, better homes. Where do you live? Oh, I live in Saratoga. I live in Woodside. The, the reality is one brother once told me was my, my zip code is going to be the graveyard in Livermore. I better memorize that. That's my address. And he passed away. Very young. Cancer. And he, you know, his son, I tell his son, I said, you know what your dad's address is? Because his son is a friend of mine and a student of mine and a hajj buddy of mine. And he smiles. He goes, I know. Ahmad al-Hilu, plot, you know, Five Pillars Farm, plot D10, Livermore, California. He goes, that's my dad's address. You know, that's the reality of life. So our, our priority in choosing our burial site should be not our distance from home, um, yet um, where, where many Muslims are buried. Now this brings up a whole other can of worms that we will talk about tomorrow. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. Yesterday we left off at transporting the body, if I recall. Is that where we left off? Does anyone remember? No? Yes. So transportation of the body. The general Islamic understanding is that transporting the body from one town to another town is not allowed, let alone go to a, a different state or country altogether. So once a person passes away, if there is a graveyard uh, in the same town, then that person should be buried in that graveyard, the graveyard closest to one's house. Now because we as Muslims have certain requirements in regards to how a person should be buried, um, facing the Qibla, being around other Muslims and so on and so forth, so a person should be able to access the closest Muslim graveyard possible to one's home where uh, one can be buried. To take them out of state would be incorrect, to take them overseas would be incorrect. Um, there's an entire process of embalming that is done to a body if people only knew what that, you know, what, what a body would go through uh, when it would be embalmed, most people would choose not to do so. And Islamically it is uh, incorrect for an individual's body to be transported, especially from one country to, to another country. And where, where my parents live in England, uh, unfortunately, this is very this is a very common practice amongst people from certain countries that when they pass away, they choose for their deceased to be um, transported to a different country altogether. Uh, and one should refrain from that. One should be aware of that. And if a loved one has made that has expressed that desire, they should be explained that it is incorrect to do so. And um, if they've passed away and the decision is with you, then it would be perfectly fine for you to not abide by that uh, wasiyah and have them buried in a graveyard close by. So one should be conscious of that. Um, Wills. Uh, Siri Yahya, if I recall, is going to be speaking to Wills tomorrow, uh, but one should have a will um, even if you're not wealthy, uh, even if you're not old. Uh, because, again, as we discussed yesterday, life has no guarantees. A person could pass away at any time. And ensure that one's assets are distributed according to Islamic law. That's very, very crucial. Um, and uh, very briefly, I'm, I'm sure Sidi Yahya will talk about this, but you know, if you want to give, once you pass away, once you pass away, the assets are distributed according to Islamic law, period. If what you've left behind in your will is contrary to Islamic law, Islamic law, I mean, People may get what you left behind in your will because that's what the law says. But one will be accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you wish to give more away to one child over the other, that needs to be done in your lifetime. That can't happen after you die. Okay? You can't. So you can't say that I want 50% of this to go to my daughter and then the other 50% to be divided between the other three children. Because this daughter took care of you. If, now, if you want to give 50% away, you can give it away in your lifetime. 
make them the owner. They ha you have to hand over the ownership. But once you pass away, if that child was to take 50%, then you would be in sin, that child would be in sin. Right, so make it very so. So the point I'm trying to make is that be conscious and be well aware of the wills that we uh, prepare. Online wills are useless. There is not a single will that I've come across online, including Isna's. With all due respect to Isna, uh, that is reliable and that can be used. So, and there's a mashallah. There's a number of young Muslims uh, out there, young Muslim lawyers that are preparing wills for the Muslim community. So, um, you know. Utilize that, make sure your will um, is prepared. Khair, a person passing away, once, uh, if a person is near one's death, if possible, if possible, you have to keep things in mind. You can't be in a hospital expecting the whole bed to be turned around, right? But if it's possible, uh, face them towards the Qibla. There's two ways of doing this. Either um, their, their head is somewhat raised facing the Qibla or they're sleeping, they're lying down in a, in a, in a way where their right side is facing the Qibla as a person is, is buried. So face them towards the Qibla. Um, the Prophet والسلام, is narrated to have said, لَقِّنُوا مَوْتَاكُمْ uh, Remind the dying individual of the Shahada. You would never, it would be incorrect to, to tell a dying person to say the Shahada. You wouldn't tell a dying person, say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. That is incorrect. Because the pangs of death, the Prophet والسلام, is narrated to have said, إِنَّ لِلْمَوْتِ لَسَكَرَاتِ Verily, there are pangs, difficulties at the time of death. The Prophet والسلام, himself experienced the difficulties at the time of death. And so the Prophet والسلام, teaches us that in that moment of pain and anguish, it's possible a person may deny saying the shahada. Right, may deny it because of the pain that they're going through. Or say, would say something like, be quiet, I don't want to hear it, or something along those lines. And that's why one is to never tell a dying person to say, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. You would simply go close to the dying person and continue reciting Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah so that they can hear it. We're also reminded that uh, 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 the person who is passing away close by them, the Prophet ﷺ recommended that Surah Yasin be recited by the living individuals at the bedside of the individual who is passing away in order to make it easy for that individual. If for whatever reason that person has wronged you, has done something to you, forgive them at that moment so that their passing from this life into the next life becomes easy. Right? Because if someone holds a grudge, that could make it difficult for a person to pass on into the next life. Once a person has said the shahada, if you hear them say the shahada, all conversations should be seized. That's it. Everyone remains silent. Right? No one. Even if the long lost child who hasn't seen the parent for 50 years shows up, that child is not as important as their shahada that they've just recited. You want the final words of an individual to be Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasoolah. Right, so keep this in mind because it's very, uh, again, I get to see people dying and it's very common for a lot of family members to be present. A person has said their shahada and then this daughter who lives in another state, a son who lives far away, a grandchild who just flies in, wants to meet that individual. Oh, look who's here. Ibrahim is here. Fatima is here. Aisha is here. No, Ibrahim, Fatima and Aisha don't matter anymore. There's, there's a much greater journey that is, let's save the questions till the end inshallah, but write them down, I don't want, to forget, I don't want you to forget. Um, so Ibrahim, Fatima and Ahmed don't matter. What matters is, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. So now it's very possible that a person may not say those words, Allah forbid, but that, that, that should not be taken as any negative sign. That's between an individual and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They might have said it in their heart, they might have said it before they went to sleep and so on and so forth. But our responsibility is to remind them of, of, of the shahada. Don't ask them to repeat it after you. Uh, it's common, I've seen again, very common that family members leave I pods behind uh, in the hospitals uh, that are, you know, Surah Yasin repeat on that individual, um, which is perfectly fine. There's no harm in doing so, but but there's nothing like a live person reciting Yasin, even if it takes an hour versus an iPod playing Surah Yasin, right? There's, it's, there's the barakah, the essence is, is different. Um, a, a, a being close to a dying person, one should, family members should be silent. They should not be crying. 
um, that person, moments before an individual's death, that person is no longer with you. They're in a different realm. They're in a different realm. They see angels. They will literally see angels coming to them. Right? And if they are, if they are pious, then their soul will leave this dunya with ease. And if they're not, may Allah forbid, there will be difficulty. <coughs> Right, there will be difficulty. And again, I, I, I have to cover my material. I don't have time to tell you stories. But I, I, I do recall, I, I know of two deaths where family members who experienced that dying person remained almost in fear for days on end. One of them was an adult who experienced a friend of his passing away who died, who died with much, much difficulty, and may Allah protect us all from a difficult death. I mean, uh, but he, he experienced that, and for days, he, he was, he's a grown adult, a very strong man, not just physically, but he's a very strong individual. He would not go to the bathroom without leaving the door um, open. He would leave the door open. That's how much fear he had. He was he just, he was really affected by it. So may Allah protect us from a painful death. I mean, Ya Rabbul Alameen. So one should, one should be calm, collective to the, and if you're going to, crying is normal, but if you're going to cry with a lot of noise, then one should step out of the room or, or so on. There's, there's a certain adab. And, it's good, it's good that we're discussing this now because these things are very difficult to discuss when someone else, someone's pa passing away, right? I've, I've learned that um, when people, once a person passes away during the washing and during the burial, that's really not the time to correct people. Uh, we had a janazah, I think, in, in Ramadan, two, two, three weeks ago, and uh, there were certain minor mistakes that were being made and people were st starting to become concerned and really, it was Ramadan, people needed to get home for iftar and so on and so forth. And I, I made a very loud announcement. I said, this is not the time to ask fiqh questions. The time to ask fiqh questions was before you passed away, before the individual. Right now, we just need to get that person buried inside their grave and move on to the next life. And then we can go back and learn fiqh. You should have learned this earlier on. Otherwise, there was all these questions, people were flying around. Khair. As I mentioned earlier, forgive the dying person, um, you know, for the, forgive the dying individual, and one should do the same. If people have wronged us, l let them be with Allah. Just forgive people and move on. Um, when the person passes away, saying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon, seizing all recitation of the Qur'an, right? If once a person passes away, you don't recite any Qur'an until after the person is washed, uh, the kafan is put on. Um, if the eyes are open, close the person's eyes. If the mouth is open, close the person's mouth. If the arms are bent, make, the, make sure the arms are straight. If the feet are not straight, make sure the feet are straight. Um, cover them. Uh, if a person's mouth keeps opening, it would be permissible to tie the mouth, right? With, with. Um, cover the body with a clean sheet. Uh, try your best not to cry. Again, as I mentioned, if you're going to cry, try not to do it in the same room as the deceased individual. Remember, the, the, body is, the body is no longer functioning, but the ruh and the soul still has a connection with the body that will remain until the end of time. Whether the body remains or not, whether the, because it's a common question, there have been people who cho choose to be cremated simply that if there's no existence of myself, God can't punish me. This, this is what people would say, that I, I want to be cremated so God can't punish me. Um, people ask and say, what if you drown at sea? What happens, you know, there's no body anymore, everything dissolves. Uh, how can God punish me or how can, how can I receive the ni'mah? That's, that's, that's the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the will of, and the body remains to have a connection, whether the body remains or not, um, but there's, there's, a, there's a connection with the ruh at all times, and so one should be, one should be conscious of that. Uh, hasten in preparation, trying to do things, at, we discussed this briefly yesterday, but trying to complete the formalities as soon as possible. Right. Waiting for individuals is incorrect. Just know that as a rule. Waiting for anyone is incorrect. Right. As soon as a person passes away, whatever legal formalities need to be completed, they should be completed. As soon as they are completed, uh, the body should be washed, wrapped in a kafan, and immediately taken to burial. As soon as possible. That's Islam. That's what the Prophet ﷺ teaches us. 
uh, washing, of course, men washed by men, women washed by women. The first preference is given to the most immediate um, relatives. Um, there's a great reward in washing individuals. If this is something that you think you can handle, then um, this is something that you should volunteer to do. Right? One thing, something that one should volunteer to do in your local masajid, in your local uh, communities. Um, a lot of people shy away from this. A lot of people are, some people can't handle it, which is perfectly fine. If you can't handle it, you can't handle it. But if you think you can, there's great reward in doing so. Um, at, at one of our masajid locally, we have a whole list of about 20 to 25 male and female volunteers. And as soon as someone passes away, they have a list, an email goes out, and um, you know, people just respond and they just show up. Um, some from work, some from home, however it is. Um, not an easy time. Khair, um, organ donation. A lot of people want to talk about organ donation. This is a very, very lengthy topic. There's a lot of khilaf on this issue. In brief, there are opinions, valid opinions on both sides. Though it seems the divide has become sort of much of the ulama of the Indo subcontinent versus the ulama of the Arab world, the ulama of the subcontinent are very very wary and they, they say that uh, it is um, incorrect, it would be impermissible to donate any organs of your body after passing away. Whereas the ulama, and again I'm, I'm being very general here, um, but the ulama of the Arab world are generally of the opinion that organs can be donated after a person passes away. So ultimately the decision becomes yours. Uh, me personally, because I do come from the subcontinent, I've studied in the subcontinent primarily, um, I personally am the, of, of the opinion that organ donation is, is not allowed. Um, and so, again, we can talk about this forever, but we don't have, we, we won't go into this. Washing. Um, there's a whole method, there's, there's just a whole uh, process of washing, um, laying the body down, putting the body on a flat surface, removing the clothing, but doing it in such a way where the private parts of the males and the females are not exposed, um, not talking during the process, not reciting during the pro uh, reciting Quran during the process. Um, if one were to see um, anything on an individual's body, on the dying person's, on the, on the deceased person's body, never to share that with anyone. There's a lot of amana. It's an amana. If you see something, to not, to not share that uh, with anyone. Um, I've had one instance in all these years where a friend of mine um, washed another mutual friend of ours um, who had died at the age of 26, and uh, he just couldn't hold it in. He just had to tell someone. And, and he told, he came to me and said, I, I just need to, I feel I need to tell someone. And he ended up telling me. And it was, it was, it was a very difficult, uh, you know, what, what he experienced was, was not um, something nice at all. And so it's an amana. One should be conscious, one should be aware of this. Um, the, ghusl, the ghusl is a whole process altogether. I'm not going to go into it. I, I unfortunately don't have time, but pressing the stomach, um, washing the private parts, uh, making sure that you do wudu, uh, uh, you know, a, wudu, a formal wudu is done. Um, you don't put any water in the mouth. You don't put any water in the mouth. You take a cotton ball and clean the mouth. Um, washing the entire body three times. Now, there's a whole method. And if you are, if you're interested, you should learn how to do so, right? The, like, as I mentioned, there's a great reward um, in doing so. Then, of course, putting on the kafan. Right? The kafan in and of itself is a whole uh, process altogether. Men, three pieces of cloth. Women, five pieces of cloth. The preference is white, though if it was of a different color, it would still be allowed. So know that it would be allowed. The preference, though, the sunnah is white, um, and, and the body is, is covered. Um, viewing the body, okay, seeing the dying deceased, permissible, okay, permissible. After a person is washed, the kafan is put on. Um, if people wish to see the deceased, um, they can do so. If they wish not to, there's no harm. You're not, you shouldn't force anyone to see the deceased. Okay, one should never force anyone to see the deceased. If they, uh, if they wish to, they can do so. Men can see men. As far as women, 
you know, only women can see women. If it's a mahram, they can see the women. But um, there's there's no harm in seeing. And I, the reason I mention this is again, because Muslims in the United States are from so many different backgrounds. I, I tell people, just as I have seen every type of possible Muslim wedding, I have seen every type of possible Muslim uh, funeral. And every funeral has its own unique taste. Okay, every, and and I, I won't even generalize with people from certain countries. I mean, people from certain parts of certain countries will do things differently at, bur at burials and, and funerals. So, and you know, as an imam, you really have to be open-minded. You can't call, you can't say everything is haram, 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 as many people do so. I mean, this is part of their tradition. And so you have to understand that. Um, yet at the same time, um, so if, you, if one wishes to view uh, a deceased person, uh, they can do so. Um, mourning is for three days only. Only. Mourning is for three days only. Uh, I know in certain traditions, mourning goes on and on and on for days on end where people continue to, especially if you're back home, um, visitors continue. It's, it's okay to visit an individual's family or household if you haven't visited them. But because where I come from in India, um, family members come to your house the day of the death, they come the next day, they come the day after, and then all of a sudden, they just come every day, everyone comes, recite either tasbih or recites the Quran, and almost becomes like, uh, you know, a, a, an obligation or sort of like a, a social gathering for almost three, four, five weeks, right? And and up to the 40th day. The 40th day has no specific religious significance in Islam. And so I remember arriving at my house in India on the thir second or third day after my grandfather passed away. And um, on, on the evening of the third day, I just made an announcement. I said, from tomorrow, I don't want anyone to come to our house to mourn. Tomorrow you can come and visit us, you can talk to us, but mourning is over now. Um, of course, a lot of relatives got very upset. Um, and uh, they all went and complained to my father. And uh, my father just remained silent, which means I won. <laughs> But really, it, it, it becomes, it's, if, you come, if you're from certain parts of the world, it, there's so many rituals that are just incorrect. Now, if someone wishes to come and make dua, no harm, right? Um, in fact, for almost a year, people would come to our house here in England um, and, and, you know, um, just make dua. They hadn't met us, so they would come and, you know, they would come and make dua. There's no harm in doing so. But perpetual mourning for days on end or weeks on end is incorrect. Um, then there's this tradition where you can't cook in the deceased's house for three days. Incorrect. Incorrect. You can cook. You can make tea. I just sometimes feel that it's a cop-out. No one wants to cook, so they figure out, okay, we can... No, like on a very serious note, you can cook, you can make chai, you can, you know, there's no, so I, it, where I come from, again, is another tradition where, oh, you can't cook for three days. I don't know where people get this, right? Um, so being, being aware of this, uh, you know, you can cook. Um, also, taking flowers. Taking flowers is not an Islamic tradition. Taking flowers is not an Islamic tradition. And this is something that I'm working on so hardly. I tell people, don't bring flowers to a funeral. Okay, you're wasting $10. Now, if you're going to a funeral of a person of another faith where taking flowers is part of the tradition, sure, no harm in doing so. If someone from another faith brings flowers to a Muslim's funeral because that's how they express their condolences, no harm in doing so. But for a Muslim to bring flowers to a Muslim's funeral, incorrect. You've just wasted $10. If it was me, I'd have rather stopped at a red light and given $10 to a homeless person to buy a meal or a drink uh, and, and relate the thawab and the reward of that to the dying person. There's more merit in that than bringing flowers to the funeral. What is found in the sunnah is that after a person is buried to grow something on the grave, not laying down flowers. I've seen this. People lay out flowers. Those flowers are going to wilt and die in two days. In fact, the, 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 the person, the caretaker of the, fun the, the graveyard hates it. He goes, Imam Sahib, tell these people to not bring these flowers. I have to clean it up after th two, three days. Right? What's found in the sunnah is growing a tree. What's found in the sunnah is growing grass. Because that green, that living, will make tasbih. Uh, and, and the deceased that in that grave will, will receive the ajr and reward of that. So, so being aware of that, you know, I mean, it's just a waste, waste of money. Um, a burial, oh, well, well, let's, um, okay, so you wash 
and then of course you naturally may put the body in a coffin. Um, a coffin is not required. Uh, if there was a coffin for whatever reason, it's perfectly fine. There's no, you know, uh, there, people shouldn't get uh, hung up over issues like this. Um, although the preference is to not use a coffin. But in certain states, in certain countries, it may be a requirement. I was just dealing with some Muslims in Idaho in Ramadan, and they purchased their first and only f uh, Muslim, you know, graveyard, and um, the, 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 the county or the state government mandated for them them to use coffins and you know I mean it's it's a process right um, and every, by the way it's not just for Muslims it's for everyone it's part of their mandate so it may be something that they work on in in, in the state of California uh, we don't we're, we're allowed to not use coffins we use a cardboard box or a coffin or whatever to, to take the deceased to the graveyard. When we get to the graveyard, we open up the cardboard box and we take the body and put it directly into the grave. But what you will find in California that you may not find in other states is that there's a concrete vault inside there. Okay, there's a large... Is, is, is it the same on the East Coast? Yeah? Yeah, we have concrete vaults and the body goes inside the concrete vault. Once the body's inside, everyone moves away. A big tractor comes and puts a big cover, a big concrete cover that only a tractor can lift on top of that. It's a requirement due to earthquakes and floods and landslides. Um, so yes, we can opt to not have a coffin, but so there are certain requirements, legal requirements that need to be fulfilled. Now what's, again, I, I, I have so many, uh, I went to a graveyard once, <coughs> The vault is usually about mm, maybe two feet high. I'm being a little generous, about two feet high. The body's put inside the vault and then it's on, covered on top. I went to a graveyard once where the vault was like three and a half feet, four feet high. And it was so difficult to bury the deceased inside because, you know, if the vault is only two feet, it's much easier for people who've been to burials, you know, you can easily, this is a vault this high, you're trying to get the body inside. And so I, I remained silent. And then afterwards, I went to the non-Muslim funeral director and I inquired, I said, why are your vaults so deep? He goes, oh, your community requested this. I said, why would we request this? Well, he goes, maybe it's something like after they die because they sit up when the angels come and they need room to sit up. <laughs> it's a true story. I can tell you the name of the graveyard is, oh God, I'm forgetting now. Lone Tree Cemetery in Hayward, California. Right? It's, this is what they told me. And there's, there's hundreds of graves that have these really high vaults. And, and I tried to explain the, the imam who's sort of in charge of that, and he just never got the point. He says, no, 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 they have to sit up, they need room. You know, I said, you know, they really don't need room. They're in a different realm altogether. I've always, I've always told, uh, you know, subhanAllah, once you, once you enter into the grave, once you pass away, it's a different life altogether. Once you go into the grave, it's a different life altogether. You start seeing things and experiencing things that you never did before. Right? That's the eternal life. You get to see angels, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Khair. Um, so, so coffins, right? You can if you wish to, you can opt out if you'd like. Um, according to the Hanafi school of thought, Salatul Janaza inside a masjid is makruh and disliked. And the reason behind, yeah, it's very common in America. The reason behind that is because there could be impurities on the body that may come out into the masjid. That's why in the Hanafi school, uh, it's makruh and disliked. And so I've, I learned something which was really, really cool. I went to Dr. Muzammal Siddiqui uncle's masjid uh, some years ago in Southern California. And the mihrab was really nice and beautiful. And there was this stained glass. And I kind of went close to the stained glass in the mihrab to touch it and feel it. And it shook. I was like, oh, why is this shaking? You know, and there was no one in the masjid, so I could do whatever I wanted to. And, and so I, I shook it, and I realized it was a door, and it, it slid. So the door slid open, and I found another room in front of the mihrab with a big door on the side. And so it's really cool when, when they, they bring in janazas, everyone remains right where they are. The janazah doesn't come inside the masjid, it remains outside the masjid. And they just open these two big doors, bring the janazah in. And then in front of the mihrab where the imam stands, they just open the stained glass door and they just pray salat al janazah from inside there. Right, so the masjid that we're constructing in San Jose, we're doing the exact same thing now. Right, so you, you don't have to say so if you're ever constructing a masjid, um, you know it's you, you need more than engineers and doctors uh, when you're constructing a masjid. You need imams as well. 
Um, as far as far as leading Salatul Janazah, um, if there is a if there is an immediate relative, uh, you're killing me with this. Uh, if there's an immediate relative who is capable of leading the prayer, then um, they can and should lead the prayer. The uns, the closeness felt by a relative, um, is more than um, anyone else. Though, uh, according to certain ulama, if there is a pious person who may not be uh, related to the deceased, um, some ulama give preference to that because of their piety and their acceptance of, of dua. Um, another very common thing that pe a, a lot of Muslims don't know the dua of janazah. Okay, a lot of Muslims don't know, like, they don't even know how to pray janazah. It's really sad that every time I have to lead a janazah, I have to explain how to do janazah. Right? People don't know. Um, and then um, the dua of janazah. So if you don't know the dua of janazah, memorize it. The, the, the coffin, the coffin when praying Salat al Janazah ideally should be on the ground. But if it happens to be on a stand, there's no harm. The sunnah is for it to be on the ground. The sunnah is for the body to be on the ground. We had a, we had a case a few, a, a few years ago where um, a brother in our community was, was shot to death. Um, and many of his family members were not Muslim. And they brought the, the coffin to the masjid. And when they brought the coffin to the masjid, the coffin was on the ground. And so the imam of their community said that we should put the coffin on a stand because in the community where I come from, if you put the coffin on the ground, it's a sign of disrespect to the deceased. And the funeral director of that masjid almost had a fight with this imam. And I got very angry. I told this brother, I said, you need to understand that more than half of the family are people of other faiths who, uh, you know, are probably experiencing a Muslim funeral for the first time. And it's not a hard set rule where the coffin has, to, the sunnah is for it to be on the ground. We understand that. But if a certain portion of our element of our community feels disrespect, then there's no harm in putting the coffin on a stand. You know, just to make people feel good and respected and so on and so forth. The guy, had a, the guy had a fight with the imam. I got really upset. And so I didn't get into the fight. I just picked up the phone and called the president of the masjid. Um, in which case I missed the Salat al-Janazah, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, according, uh, in the Hanafi school, uh, there's only two uh, elements that are uh, required in Salat al-Janazah. The four takbirat and the qiyam, the standing. Okay, the four taqbirat and the qiyam standing. Everything else is considered to be a sunnah. The method of janazah in the Hanafi school is to raise your hands, say Allahu Akbar, and tie your hands. After that, all the way through the end of the salat al janazah, you don't raise your hands. Okay, they remain tied. After the first takbirah in the Hanafi school, you recite thana, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, wa tabarak asmuk, wa ta'ala jadduk, wa la ilaha ghayruk. After the second takbir, salat ala rasul, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, and then Allahumma barik ala Muhammad. After the third takbir, the dua of janazah, Allahumma ghafir li hayyina wa mayyitina. And then after the fourth takbir, salam to the right and salam to the left. In the Shafi'i school, uh, after the first takbir, you recite Surah Al-Fatiha. After the second takbir, as is, Salat ala Rasul. After the third takbir, dua for the deceased. After the fourth takbir, dua for the mayyit, and then salam. Right. Um, both methods are, are valid. Also in the Shafi'i school, you raise your hands to your ears each time. In the Hanafi school, you don't. You, they just remain um, tied. Um, I was at a janazah once where... Um, you know, if, you, if you're formally re praying janazah that's not inside the masjid, it's in another area, that the rows are close to each other, right? They're uh, maybe a feet apart, a foot apart, because you don't have to make sajda. I recall someone saying, very an older elderly uncle saying, Oh, brother, stand far apart. How are we going to make sajda? It's a true story, right? Which just goes to prove miskin. He probably never prayed janazah in his life, and this was the first one. Um, carrying the janazah after salah, it's sunnah, it's preferred to carry the janazah. Um, reciting kalima tayyibah all along, la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah, la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. The sunnah is to... Alhamdulillah. Okay. We're talking about carrying, it's okay, we'll continue. Uh, the sunnah is to... Um, the sunnah is to carry the coffin or the janazah on your right shoulder. Right, so to the left of the janazah, on, starting with your right, 10 steps on this shoulder on the right side, and then 10 steps on the back, and then 10 steps on the front, on this shoulder, and then 10 steps on the back. That's 40 steps, that's the sunnah, if it's possible. If it's not possible, then so be it. 
women cannot and should not carry the janazah. Upon entering the cemetery, there's a very specific salam that should be made to the deceased. Memorize that salam. Assalamu alaikum ya ahl al qubur. Yaghfirullahu lana wa lakum wa inna insha Allah bikum lahiqun. Nasalullah lana wa lakum al afiyah. Uh, at our cemetery, inshallah, I'm, have, I'm, I'm ensuring that this dua is posted at the cemetery. Just don't fall on me. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> that the, if you are in charge of a community where you have a cemetery, make sure you have the adab of the cemetery posted at the entrance of the cemetery. Allah will reward you for this. And if Allah has given you the financial ability to do so, pay for it as well. Right? Um, but the dua, most people don't know the dua when you enter the cemetery. There's a specific dua to be made when you enter, specific salam to be made to the deceased in the cemetery in which you are making dua maghfirah for them, you're making dua maghfirah for yourself and you're reminding yourself that you will be joining them soon. Nas'alullah, right? We will be joining you by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't step on graves, another very common mistake that people make, right? And most people know, this is, this is the problem, most people know, but A, either they, they're not conscious of this when they go to the graveyard, and B, they don't teach their children. My biggest problem is not teaching children. Right now, when we have funerals in the community and they happen to be on the weekend, I take my children with the intention of teaching them. Now, with the intention of teaching them, saying the dua with them when we enter into the graveyard, uh, making sure that they're not stepping on graves, going from the graves of friends, I don't have any relatives, but friends, um, not in America that have been buried, but uh, you know, friends' graves, my father's friends' graves, and making dua for each of them you know, by the time the, the janazah arrives. As far as putting the body inside the grave, there are two methods of doing so. One is to take it from the side of the, because the, the deceased is buried facing the qibla. So taking, putting the, putting the box or whatever the, the deceased is being carried on, on the side of the qibla and then taking them into the grave. And another opinion is to take them from the side of the feet, right? putting the coffin, putting them by the feet and then slowly sliding them in and then into the grave. Um, once the coffin or the deceased is put inside the grave, the sunnah is to put three handfuls of dirt into the grave. Um, this is not done on the body. There are some people in some communities where they actually put dirt on the body to the extent where they will remove the cover of the coffin and put dirt on, that's incorrect, that's disrespect. Right? Making sure that either the coffin is covered or the covering of the vault is put on and then you put three handfuls of dirt. The sunnah is to recite the ayah, minha khalaqnakum, one handful of dirt, from this we created you. Well, second handful of dirt, wa fiha nu'idukum, to this we return you. And third handful of dirt, wa minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhra. And from this you will again be recreated. Uh, that's the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. These are things, du'as and ayahs we need to learn. These are not for other people. These are all for us. Uh, the sunnah is for the, for the graves to look like the hump of a camel, if it's possible to do so. In some cases it is, in other cases it isn't. There's no harm in putting a headstone at the, at the grave site. At the grave site. Um, once a person passes away, it is found in the sunnah that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited from Surah Al-Fatiha, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, to Walad Dalleen, and then Alif Lam Mim Dhalik Al-Kitabu La Rayba Fih, to Humul Muflihun, by the head side, and then he alayhi salatu wa sallam moved over to the foot side, on, by the feet, and recited Aman Rasulu until the end of the surah, and then made dua for the deceased. There's no harm in doing so, this is found in the ahadith, and if someone tells you it's incorrect to do so, don't listen to them. Okay. I'm just, I'm being very brief. The Prophet Wasallam reminds us that once a person is buried, for as long as it takes for an individual to walk 40 steps, how long does it take to walk 40 steps? Anyone want to guess? Yeah, 15, 20 seconds, that's all, pretty much that's all. For as long, for as long as it takes to walk 40 steps is passed, once a person is buried, two angels will come to that individual, to that deceased individual, they will come back to life, and when they come back to life, they will ask the questions. Man Rabbuk Madinuk, who is your Lord? What is your faith? 
And that's why the ulama mentioned two things. We find two things in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. One hadith in one hadith you find that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam stood by the grave site and spoke to the dying individual and reminded them that when the angels come to you and they ask you who is your Lord, say my Lord, Qul Rabbi Allah. When they ask you about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, say that my uh, Nabi is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You also find in another tradition that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reminded the close friends and family members to stand by the grave site for a few moments, for a few minutes, making dua for that individual. Because ultimately that is the deciding factor. Right, that's the deciding. If you succeed there, you will continue to succeed all the way into paradise. And if Allah forbid one fails there, then they will continue failing until they enter into the hellfire. Unless there's some mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one needs, so again, when a person is buried, don't just start walking away. If you're a close friend or a family member, remain by the gravesite for a few minutes and make dua for that individual. Okay. Um, Okay, um, it is, women are allowed to go to the graveyard. Okay, it's permissible for women to go to the graveyard, except the ulama mentioned that they should be in a state of purity if they go to the graveyard. There's no harm in going. There's a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ reminds us that the women shouldn't go to the graveyard. But then there's another hadith that abrogates that hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ says that I used to discourage you from going. No one wants to mention that hadith. I used to discourage you from going to the graveyard, but now I allow you to go to the graveyard. So women can go to the graveyard. Women can go to burials as well. I just like to tell people that make sure that the men are with the men and the women are with the women. As long as you know the genders are separated uh, and there's certain there's a certain level of adab, uh, there's no harm in doing so. If anyone is going to wail and cry at a funeral or a burial, then they should not go close to the grave. Because remember, as I mentioned, the the body still has a connection with the ruh. The ruh can feel and hear and see the crying of individuals, and that hurts the individual. Okay, that hurts the individual. It makes it difficult for that person. So there should be, crying is natural, wailing is not. Crying is not. The Prophet ﷺ cried at the passing of his son Ibrahim. In certain narrations, it's mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ cried at the passing of his wife Khadija, but he did not wail, he did not scream. That is not allowed. And then to go to the graveyard, uh, there's no harm in, I, I, you know, I come from a tradition where women don't go to the graveyard, period. And I find that detrimental. Um, I believe that everyone needs to the grave, go to the graveyard to remind themselves of death. You know, it's, it's crucial. Khair, what else can you do for the deceased? And I'm going to end with this before I take your questions. Continue making dua for the deceased regularly. The best form of giving them or granting them reward, ajr, thawab, is as my father says, reciting Surah Al-Ikhlas for them three times every day. Three times every day. Or if you can, recite Surah Yaseen for them every day. My father tells us two things. He goes, my mother, my, my grandma passed away in 1989. He goes, there hasn't been a day since she passed away in 1989 and I have not recited a Surah Yaseen for her. Okay. And then he instructs us and says that I, I require for you to recite Yasin for me every day from the day I pass away until the day you pass away. If you don't, you will be answerable to Allah on the day of judgment. He, these are his sons. He has every right to make that request. Um, but, you know, we, we, I come from a tradition where the deceased are remembered once a year. Quran Khani at the home. Big, you're, the host is more worried about catering the food and moving the furniture than praying for their own parent, right? And you expect others to recite Quran for your parents. Mm -mm. No, you pray for them. Pray for them daily, even if it's only reciting Surah Al Ikhlas three times daily. That's more valuable than having a Quran Khani once a year for your parent. Uh, you want to feed people? Feed the poor and needy in our communities. Right? Feed the homeless, feed the poor and needy, 
and grant the reward and the ajr of, the, of that to, to, your, to your deceased family members, parents. Allah is very kind, Allah is very merciful. Um, Allah does not uh, distribute the reward. Allah doesn't cut up, the, you recite one yaseen, Allah won't cut up the reward of that. Say, this is for my father. No, if you make, you can recite one yaseen and relate the thawab of that to the entire ummah and Allah will give the reward of that entire yaseen to the entire ummah. Allah will not cut it up in 20 billion pieces as human beings do and then say, okay, here is a portion of this reward. No, Allah doesn't do that. Allah is very merciful. So being aware of that, being conscious of that. Khair, I'm going to stop here. I know this, there may be questions. I'm assuming there's questions. So let's get through the questions, inshallah. Yes, brother. You're going to have to be loud. Yes. No, it does matter. We find in the ahadith, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Now again, that person may not know and so on and so forth, but as long as the Prophet ﷺ, there's two ahadith. Man qala la ilaha illallah dakhala al-jannah. Whosoever says la ilaha illallah will enter into paradise. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, Man kana akhiru kalamihi la ilaha illallah dakhala al-jannah. Whosoever's final words are la ilaha illallah will enter into paradise. The Prophet ﷺ also reminds us that for anyone who uses a siwak, Will be, will be, will have the ability and the tawfiq to remember the shahada at the time of passing away. Now, you can be the modern American Muslim and say that I'm going to use a toothbrush and it's the same thing, but the siwak is the actual sunnah. And so, you know, there's no harm. I, I have, I have a toothbrush as well and I have my sensodyne toothpaste, but next to it is my siwak and I do use my siwak at least once if not twice a day, just with the intention of the sunnah that this is what the Prophet ﷺ did and I want to do to the best of my ability as closest to what the Prophet ﷺ did. So, uh, keeping that in mind. Have I answered your question? Your question was, does it have to be just... Is it more important to have said la ilaha illallah or to have said the whole... Muhammadur Rasulullah. We find from our traditions that the ulama mention is the whole thing. Although the hadith, only, certain hadith only say la ilaha illallah, right? But again, it's with a, what's what's re, what the reality is what's in the heart, and that will emanate on the tongue. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Life support. Ya Allah. You know, it's it's a very scary question. Um, as the Imam of a very large masjid, you have to you end up making the decision for so many people and it's a very difficult decision. The general ruling is that if an Tabibun Hadiqun Muslimun, an experienced Muslim doctor, tells you that there is no life left in this individual, then it would be perfectly permissible to pull a person off of life support. I am generally of the opinion that if, and it's sometimes it's difficult to find a Muslim doctor, and we live in the United States where doctors are usually scared of being sued if they do something wrong, malpractice. So I'm usually assuming that they will give you the right advice. And if they do, hopefully, um, you know, if a physician tells you that, you know, this person may live and come back to life, alhamdulillah, you keep them on life support. But if they tell you that, you know, this is pretty much it, then one should pull them off of life support and, and not lo not let that person suffer. I've seen a lot of, I had one situation where uh, uh, someone close to me, um, I, I, you know, he came to me and said, you know, my mother is passing away. You know, this is what the doctors are telling me. What should I do? I said, pull her off of life support, right? I, I knew what she was going through. I said, just pull her off of life support. They didn't have the guts to do so. And they kept her on life support for nine months, during which she remained unconscious for nine months. Right, she was being fed. There was a hole and she was being fed. After nine months, she passed away. She was buried. This person then came to me and said, I wish I'd have taken your advice. Um, so it's a very difficult decision to make, but ultimately that's what it comes down to. If there are signs of life and signs of health, you keep the person on life support. Otherwise, there's no harm in pulling that person off of life support. Uh, I just had a very, very, very close friend of ours. In fact, my brothers and I lived with her for six weeks when my parents went for Hajj in 1984. She lives in San Diego, or she used to live in San Diego. For six weeks we lived there. I was, I was, oh, I don't know how old I was. I was six, and my youngest brother was only six months old. We lived with her for six weeks. Uh, a few months ago, uh, she had a, she, just all of a sudden had some chest pains, ended up at the hospital. Doctor says, we just need to put in two stents and then you'll be okay. During the procedure, 
she suffered a heart attack, there was some complications, and she, was, she went on life support. And she had made it very, very clear to her children and her brother, pr primarily her brother, that if she were to ever go on life support, she should be pulled off immediately. And that's what happened. She got pulled off immediately and she passed away. And she was not too old either. Yeah, put it in your will. Yeah. But honestly, like, instruct people. Yes, it's a very good idea to put in your will, but let people around you know. Again, this goes right back to our conversation yesterday, having that conversation. Right. Yes, any questions on the system? Yes. You're not reciting anything. Question is, in between a person being dying and them being washed, what should you recite, if anything? The answer is nothing. Yes. Again, the, we, there's no there's no hard and set yeah there's no hard and set rule, uh, but generally the, what we understand from the hadith is very very soon. Okay, now whether it's the first shovel of dirt, last shovel of dirt, the grass being put on, there's no clear indication. But it's it's happening right around that time. It's it's happening within minutes. Usually by the time if you happen to be the first one to leave after a burial to get to your car, that person's probably being questioned. You may be busy checking your text messages and your voicemails because you missed them for the last hour or two. You don't realize that your best friend is probably going through the most important exam of their life. And, and you know, I've, I've never forgotten this. My grandfather and my brother, they used to sit across from each other after Asr. My grandfather was a very strict, principled man. On the, on the flip side, his brother was very chill. They were both ulama, mashallah. And so uh, when we used to have exams, the tradition was we would go to them after Asr and request them to make dua for us. Say, you know, make dua for me. My grandfather on the one hand would say, I hope it's very difficult. Uh, and my grandfather's brother on the flip side would always say, why would you want to make it difficult? And, his, he, and this is what literally he would say. He would say, humanity knows the questions that they're going to be asked inside the grave and they're still not preparing for it. And these kids don't even know what's going to be on their finals tomorrow. That, that's all he would say. And then he would say a dua and said, go, run. We were little kids. It never made sense to us then. Now as we get older, you know, you just reminisce. That we know exactly what Allah will ask us in our graves. Yeah, city. Hey, can I get two, three minutes of your time? Jazakum Allah khair. May Allah reward you. What do you do by saying your mother passed away, your sister passed away? So generally, out of respect, you do attend the funeral, right? That's a general opinion. There are certain ulama and certain scholars who will tell you to not go at all. But if it's your parent, it's your, it's your brother, it's your sister. So attend the burial, attend the funeral, attend the burial. You just won't take part in any of the religious practices, right? But out of respect, you would. So, like, for instance, my great-grandmother passed away so you would just go and silently observe you would not take part but out of respect right it just imagine people need to understand imagine being and maybe Sidi Yahya would want to answer this later on but you know just imagine being the only Muslim in your family and not showing up to a funeral I mean what kind of a dawah are we doing to our family members and and this was this 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 hit home to uh, for us some years ago when my father's Hindu doctor passed away um, and my father was very close to him, very. He would come to our house and sit on the floor and eat with us in, in London. And when he passed away, my father, my father would always say, if there's one person in my life for whose hidayah I've made so much dua for ever is, is my doctor. Uh, he goes, I haven't made that much dua for hidayah for anyone. They were very close. And when he passed away, my father was, was in pain. And my father went to his funeral. And, you know, they cremated him. My father just respectfully stood on one side, paid his respects to the family, and, and he came home. Right. Yes. Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda has a whole chapter on condolences. 
uh, in his book Islamic Manners, and he generally says that you should make the, you should say things like we pray to Allah that they are in a better state, we pray to Allah that they are in a good state, and things along those lines. But you can't make du'a maghfirah for them. Just, just let them know exactly what you're doing. Saying so you're saying a prayer for your deceased friend. Yeah. Yes. There's a lot of questions. Yes. Naima. You have freedom in choosing whatever kind of headstone you want. I like to tell people don't put any anything in Arabic or Quranic ayahs on it because people will trample over them. Right? If if they're standing up, most grave certain graveyards have headstones standing up. To some degree, that's okay. But in mo in many graveyards now, they actually have them laying flat on the ground. People put pictures of their parents and write verses of the Quran saying Bismillah, Allah, Muhammad, and then there's a janazah that's happening and people are stepping over it. It's disrespect. No, just let grass grow on it. Yeah. Yes. So the question was that when a husband passes away, can the wife see the husband or not? Or vice versa. Yeah, there's a difference of opinion there. Sidi Yahya, is there any difference between the Shafi'i school? Permissible, right? Yeah. Yeah. In the Hanafi school, there are certain, uh, certain opinions in which you would say... Oh, ish, I'm sorry. He said that in the Shafi'i school, it's perfectly allowed. There's no harm. Yeah. Is that what I... Yes. The women folk would come in and see. Yeah. So in the Hanafi school, there are different opinions. The, the predominant opinion that's practiced in the Indo subcontinent is that you can't, uh, but it is allowed. Yes. Yes. That's, yeah, that's, that's all you can do. That's all you can do. There's only so much, if the, if the person continues to bleed after their death or so on and so forth, then there's, you just have to make do with what you have. And, and, and make dua to Allah that when we pass away, our bodies don't go through such difficulties. Amin Ya Rabbil Alameen. Yes. Uh, no. They can go to the burial, there's no harm. I've had a situation once where certain women um, wanted to put dirt in the grave as well. And it uh, became a little tricky and iffy. So I just asked the brothers to move away and let the sisters do that. I got into a little bit of trouble after that. but I've had a situation once where a wife insisted for 40 minutes that she wanted to go inside the grave with her husband. And everyone was saying no. Finally, there was an imam with us who knew what was happening. He simply said, you know what, it's okay. Let her, if she wants to go, come on sister, I'll walk with you. 40 minutes, she actually delayed the burial by 40 minutes. This is a true story. So the imam, this imam, he was a little experienced. He goes, here, I'll walk with you. And she finally said, no, 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 it's okay, you can bury him. It's, you have to understand, it's, it's a very, very difficult time. That's not the time to make and break rules. It's just a time to... Be with the situation, get done with it. Educate yourself beforehand as you're doing now so that we don't make mistakes at the time. Maybe I'll take two, three more questions and then I'll end it. There's two questions on the sister side. One, two, and three, and we'll end it with that. Yes. Naima, go ahead. Yeah, if they're not in a state of purity, the general opinion is that they shouldn't. Uh, but if they do, again, it's not a halal and haram. It's a preference versus non-preference. Yes. Um, 
Amanu Rasulu, the last two ayahs of Surah Al Baqarah. I'll take two on the brother's side, Tahir I'll take yours as well, and then we'll end with you. Ji. No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, to the end of some of the end of life issues that have been raised, um, I know certain groups, institutions are trying to publish medical ethics. Yes, they are. And um, are they the same? Are the ones out of Detroit? I'm not sure. Okay. If, if one is interested in furthering that cause, or you know, even creating a diversity of opinions in that uh, manner, would you recommend a format in which scholars and physicians or scientists combine? Efforts or in which physicians yeah. and scientists became trained in certain aspects of the science? Uh, maybe a combined effort would be would be ideal. And I know they're doing something in somewhere in Detroit. Dr. Asim Padella is working on some of these things. Uh, if you want a specific contact information, I, I may have it on my phone and I could possibly give you his email. But I know he was working on it. Yes, Tahir After the body is washed in the casket, some people like to touch, that touching the body is allowed. Uh, you know, there's one instance we find in the hadith where, where, uh, or we actually, we find that uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu kissed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we find that in the hadith. I don't know about the touching part. Uh, there's no harm kissing the forehead. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, when one of our teachers passed away, a few of our stu a few of the students actually kissed our teacher's forehead, you know, out of respect and out of uh, amal on the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yeah. Khair inshallah. Uh, all, all, the only parting advice that I would give to you is learn, learn, and learn. And especially when someone passes away, if there's some, something blatantly being done that is haram, then point it out. But otherwise, go with the flow because that's not the time to correct people. You really have to understand the situation that people are going through. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.